No, no, no problem. My French colleagues are always correcting me how I should say my name. But um, uh, thanks, uh, I'm Robert Belarjan. Uh, appreciate it, Eric, for getting us started here. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me, and hopefully, you guys can see my slides. Eric, let me know if you can't. We we can um, both. You're fine. Wonderful, wonderful. And we have video on so I can talk with my hands, which is always going to be good. Um, so so we had a couple changes in schedule. So we have uh, two talks that are back to back that I'm going to represent our team on. Uh, the first one is on configuration management. And the second one's on uh, deployment in the enterprise. Um, uh, this one's a little bit more on how how users interact with the systems. And, and the second one's more on how we deploy and how do we make tools work in the enterprise. So uh, a little bit of a, a context switch between the two, um, but uh, let's, let's get, it, get it started. Uh, appreciated the last uh, talk on automotive, um, like Eric's uh, indicated, I spent a long time working, working in automotive, um, designing cars as well as uh, running process and tools. So um, thoughts like configuration management and reuse are, are near and dear to what I've done uh, in the background and in my history. So um, what we try to do when we talk about these things, this is going to be relatively um, tool independent, but we are going to have a few demos uh, that we'll jump into here to be able to make it a little bit more real um, and add a little bit more risk as I'm doing a presentation uh, using live tools uh, in the enterprise is always fun. But um, what we want to do is make sure that you can understand why we believe configuration management and the OSLC standards important, uh, where it's available already today, and what's the motivation for us to be able to see that in more and more tools, uh, and why uh, users should be demanding more and more tool availability, um, and, and how we make that happen. And, and all this is about trying to be able to make engineers more effective. We want them to be able to use their tools and, and be um, be productive. And so when we talk about enterprise configuration, um, um, one of the things that we need to start about it, look at is how we thought of configurations in the past. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for what, 25 years now. Um, when we started talking about configurations, uh, oftentimes they were in source control. Um, so the concept of being able to have versions, to be able to have baselines, to be able to have branches, are pretty common and pretty native to all of us. Um, and we also do that just logically in a particular tool. So whether or not we're doing something like uh, requirements management doors, when we're doing a baseline, we understand the concept of versions within a tool. Um, what's new and new and, and unique um, is how do we actually branch across different domains? So if we're branching our set of requirements in our requirements management tool, we're branching our set of software in our software tool, how do these relationships take place? And intuitively we've done it based on names, we have releases that we work to, um, and that's how we do some correlation. But how do I know which version of my software relates to the, which version of my requirements? How do I keep those up to date? And how do I navigate between those resources? That's really the challenge that we're trying to address with uh, enterprise configuration management. So, not how do we do configuration management in the small, in a particular repository or particular tool, but how do we actually create some correlation or some integration across the enterprise? And that's really the objective. And, and really when we talk about these enterprise configurations, it's, it's real, in reality a realization of what we as engineers always do. Um, we always know when we're working on, uh, whether it's uh, releasing a vehicle, whether it's releasing a software product, whether it's releasing just a single uh, microcontroller that happens to be in a vehicle, we're always working in some sort of temporal context. We're working towards a particular release. We're working towards a particular gate review. So it has a time component, has a purpose. Um, it has some level of scope. So if I'm actually just working on my software team, I'm probably working on some code, I'm working on a particular build, that's my focus. If I'm a system engineer, I'm probably looking broader. I have some modeling, I have some requirements. Those are related to some software, they're related to tests. This is the scope of work that I'm operating on. And intuitively it has a collection of artifacts that I need to relate. Um, and most importantly, in that collection of artifacts, I want to be able to have a particular version of each of those artifacts. And we need to be able to span these different repositories. This has always been kind of the background of our company is we've been working with system engineers for the last 20, 25 years, 
their challenge has always been that there's not one tool of a system engineer, there's many tools. And what the notion of configuration and enterprise configuration management is doing, it allows us to be able to span those repositories, be able to identify which version of the model, which version of the requirements, which version of the software, and how do they relate to each other in a single configuration that I can operate with. And that's really our goal with enterprise configuration management. And so when we look at something like a product release, at least that means that we're going to go ahead and grab a particular bomb structure from our POM system. We're going to be able to grab uh, from our software configuration management system a set of software. Uh, we need to be able to capture these approvals, these changes that we've done along the way. And oftentimes, uh, I know from my automotive background, we always want to be able to keep the tools that we use to be able to create the software and be able to compile it. We need to create all of those things and have that be an enterprise configuration that needs to be recallable and needs to be able to span repositories. That's necessary for us to be able to have that snapshot in time that really identifies the deliverables, the assets that drove us to a particular goal. Uh, and in a smaller scale, sometimes, we're gonna do things like gate reviews. These are things that we're gonna to do to reduce risk on teams. Um, where we're gonna have an executive review. We're gonna present what our plan is, what the documents are, what test results, what risk records we might have. We want all these things available for a gate review. These are all the types of things that require us to be able to have an enterprise configuration. Um, in the absence of this, We've oftentimes just shoved documents into a particular repository. It could be something like Microsoft SharePoint. It could be our POM system. Um, those are our necessities we've done as engineers, but not necessarily the objective when we start talking about how do we build up a digital thread. And so what do we want to do when we want to uh, implement enterprise configuration within tools? Um, we want them to be basically natural, they need to be intuitive. Um, they need to focus on the current language of a tool. So if I'm in a POM tool, I need to think about uh, my bomb structure. Uh, if I'm in my software configuration management tool, I'm typically talking about a particular branch. Um, these need to be the natural languages in which, um, which they operate and also have a view to how they interact with others. And so one of the best ways for us to do this is kind of show an example um, and um, we'll show a really simple example here between JIRA and Doors Next. And the real reason here is because there's some natural things that we do from an engineering standpoint, whether it is uh, doing something uh, when we're going to implement a change where we might move a change to a different release and we intuitively want to point to a different version of those requirements, or it could be something as simple as we have a defect and where we found that defect um, is in one version, where we fix that defect is, is in another version. And we want our tools to be able to um, enable us to be able to focus on the engineering and less on the management of the version. So with that, we'll kind of jump into a little bit of a demo using OSLC and showing how configuration management with OSLC um, can be extremely valuable for us. So in this case, here I have just a simple Jira story. Um, the wonderful thing about OSLC, we have um, the nice types of integrations that we'd expect. We do simple things like rich hovers. Um, so you can be able to see into doors next without ever actually leaving Jira. We're gonna get a rich preview of that information. It's gonna tell us details about it, uh, which is great and valuable for it. Now, what's a little bit different about this and when we work with configurations, it's interesting is we want to have this natural experience that takes place. Meaning if I decide that I want to move this story from my release one to release two, I kind of want to have it actually update to the set of requirements re related to release two. And so to give you a bit, a bit of example, pay attention down here because we have a couple of things going on. Um, these are dynamic um, uh, updated titles to these requirements. There's also a status, or actually this happens to be a priority showing on these items. So as I change and tell my um, change management tool that I'm gonna push this uh, item to a new release, you're gonna see how these update. So no longer am I focusing on a scope of 10 miles. Now I'm focusing on a scope, I think of around 70 miles. That requirement changed, that version of that requirement changed. 
even such things as priorities of those items change. And this is all about how do we use configuration management. And in the, the entire sense of this, you can see that we are, we're gonna switch it actually between different configurations. This is my global configuration. This is my enterprise configuration. I'm working on release two across all these different systems. So my requirements, my tests, my changes, um, and it's gonna tell me how I index to that. And it's simply by changing the version that I'm planning to actually implement and work on this artifact. And you can see how this takes place. And in this tooling, we actually provide some additional guidance here too. Uh, when you're trying to understand how we got to that configuration, we're gonna tell you more details about what link type you were using, which means which release it was using within our current tool, which was pointing to what enterprise configuration. All that's in place to be able to make sure you're always working with the right set of requirements. That's really the power that OSLC is providing with global configuration is from a user perspective, I can just go ahead and be able to change what plan I have for each story. It's always gonna to point to the right set of requirements for that release. And the same concept takes place when I'm looking at um, my links. Some of my links have a different context, meaning um, some look forward in time, some work back in time. So in this case, this happens to be a bug. It means I found it in release 1.0 here. I'm planning to fix it in release.2, uh, which means that as I look at some of these artifacts, uh, such as my test result, my test result is actually looking back at that uh, earlier configuration where I found the issue. Um, maybe I have some implementation tasks that are associated with where I'm gonna fix it. You're gonna see that that actually points forward to the AMR 2.0 configuration. So there's this temporal context. Our configurations allow us to be able to point in the right direction of artifacts and help us instill that process. And that's why configuration management, even when we're just working with something as simple as change, is that important to how we operate. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor of that, of what we're trying to accomplish with, with folks and be able to make them successful. But let's kind of get down into some of the details of how do we get to this um, and what does that mean to us? So when we're working with these enterprise artifacts, um, there's basically two types of artifacts we traditionally work with. Um, what you saw in Jira is what I'll call a workflow artifact. Um, they have states and sequences, they have outcomes. Um, they have history, but they have no version. I'm not gonna uh, index to a previous version. My index is effectively time. So this item is gonna evolve over time. We're not gonna branch a change. Uh, occasionally we'll create a clone of it, but then it's a new workflow, new item that we need to work with. And these are owned by projects and teams. Um, they participate in that digital thread, but they're on the periphery. They're pointing to the artifacts that, that are within that digital thread. Um, the other type of artifact was the one I was pointing to, and this happens to be the assets. These are things like requirements, test cases, code, model elements. These are the, the engineering deliverables that we produce. These indeed do have versions, and these versions can be reused. We might be using multiple different versions at any one time uh, in various different configurations. Um, we're going to branch it, we're going to merge it, we're going to compare these. These are going to be owned by uh, collections, containers um, that have streams and baselines. And so this allows us to be able to manage um, both an individual version of an asset, as well as these collections, these configurations that are either dynamic like a stream or static like a baseline. This is what we're trying to establish with OSLC. And from a configuration standpoint, this is that overlay on top of those, um, those assets, meaning that I want to create a configuration means a collection of artifacts, so a scope, and a set of versions of each of those artifacts, and that comprises a configuration. Typical things that we've done, a, a Git branch, uh, released requirement document, uh, build materials with some sort of effectivity. All of these are typical configurations that we've done in the past. And those configurations tend to be local. Those are a local single repository. What we're talking about, about an enterprise configuration, is how do we assemble all of those different local uh, configurations into one global or enterprise configuration? So it's a composite of a larger set of local configurations. So this is the way in which we build this all together. Now, how do we think about this? When we start to think about how do these assets relate, um, there's all sorts of links that we're worried about between these different artifacts. 
So how do we know which version do they, they actually index to? And that's actually this digital thread that goes through. And this is what global configuration helps me pick out. When I'm trying to navigate a link, what artifact do I uh, link to in that test case, which version of that artifact, and potentially even that which version of that software. So we're trying to look for that path through that. And we're trying to be able to implement a process with that. So this is kind of the technical foundation for which we can enact processes that we execute. And so when we look at OSLC and configurations, um, what we want to do is be able to formalize this. And this is really what the OSLC standard is looking at is how do I formalize the relationship between different repositories? What is the common language that I talk about uh, of these artifacts? So how do I define uh, a unit of configuration? What are these configurations called? How do I reference these configurations? That's the whole goal of the OSLC standard. And they're doing a great job of being able to create that, implement that, and make that available for people to be able to leverage in their tools. Now, um, what we want to look at is how does that enact on our existing tools? So we're a tool vendor who often actually builds technology on top of other tools. You saw the JIRA interface, so that's our solution on top of Atlassian um, to provide those OSLC interfaces. Often these OSLC um, configuration management elements can actually be an overlay uh, on top of the existing elements that are in there that deal with how do they deal with versions? How do they deal with configurations? But how do we expose that to the rest of the enterprise? That's really on the OSLC standard. We can overlay those types of technologies on top and allow them to be able to collaborate in that enterprise and be good citizens in that enterprise. And so ultimately dealing with all those different versions is answering this question of how do I do link? Um, because in OSLC, what I wanna do is have a link between artifacts um, and these links are directional, meaning that they go from one artifact to another, um, but they're unversioned, meaning that I'm gonna talk about how one artifact relates to another artifact, but not which version of that artifact. But that's the critical decision that I have to get into is, how do I determine which version of that other artifact and that other repository I go to? And that's what configuration management's all about. It's asking that question, when I navigate this link, which version do I go to? And how do I actually implement that within my tools? So um, the basics in that standard that's important to us is that these links are owned. Um, they have, they're owned by one end, think of them as an attribute on an artifact. They have a role and they have directionality. So we're pointing from one artifact to another. Um, and so there's single direction that we need to be able to worry about. Now, the only thing that we're storing is that URL to that artifact, the title, an identifier, and the association type. So it's very simple of what that attribute is. Um, and the nice thing is we're not gonna create copies of that. The hard part or the challenging part for us to be able to do is determine that backlink, meaning when I'm in the artifact that I'm pointing to, how do I know that I'm pointing to? And this is actually, uh, part of the standard itself, which end do I actually store this link information? And then ultimately, furthermore, how do I resolve um, that backlink? So to a great extent, this is why I have something like an LDX, uh, an indexing service that allows me to determine things because to discover this backlink, I'm gonna go through a series of steps to be able to ask this question. In my current configuration, is there anybody linking to me? and be able to actually determine what incoming links are, are there and display those links and be able to make them available. It makes uh, a good context to be able to operate and be able to see those artifacts dynamically and be able to work in multiple configurations at the same time. So a little bit um, uh, example here would be when I'm working in something like Doors Next, um, I don't actually uh, store any of my change artifacts within Doors Next. Uh, in fact, when I'm working with something like Doors Next, uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's get to the right view. Uh -huh. um, you're going to see that I'm working in configuration. Now, this link to my Jira artifact, even though I can have a rich hover to that, um, there's no information stored within Doors Next about that, which is great because anytime that I move my configuration, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do that discovery check. I'm gonna check that index. So if I actually go ahead and uh, switch my configuration, so let's switch my configuration to a different configuration. 
what you're going to see is it's going to go ahead and do another discovery check. And when it does that discovery check, it's going to find a new set of JIRA artifacts and potentially in this case, RQM artifacts that are linked into my doors next requirements. So it's not just that I actually have uh, artifacts within uh, one place or one set of repositories. You're going to see that as I do this discovery, it's going to span across the enterprise looking for any incoming requirements from whatever tool or incoming artifacts with whatever tool and allows me to be able to switch configurations dynamically show the backlinks to the artifacts that I need to work with. Um, and I know I'm running a little short on time. Um, I think uh, we have probably a couple extra minutes here to go because I think the next talk is going to be a little bit short, shorter and seeing I'm the speaker in both of them, I'll steal from the next speaker a little bit because I think there's a couple other interesting things that we should we should talk about here and then we'll get to the whole set of questions that I imagine um, uh, people are operating with. So how do we manage these enterprise configurations? Um, they're cross repository. So what do I do about this? How do I compose these? Um, you're going to need something like an enterprise configuration manager. Um, uh, I know a lot of us end up working with um, IBM's global configuration management tool, um, which is helpful for us to be able to, to compose these configurations. Because these configurations are across repository, so I can include some requirements, I can include some test cases, I can include how I might even reference, in this case down here, you'll see uh, JIRA. Um, release and how it's referenced into a particular configuration for discovering those JIRA artifacts. Um, I can also do things, and we've done this in the past, we've contributed um, uh, bomb configurations from Windchill into this same global configuration. Uh, the whole idea here is that we have to have one entity that tells us, gives us a label, and tells us what are all the local configurations that are included in there. And what's nice about it, we can also create hierarchies of this so we can compose uh, like we would within engineering. We might have a subsystem uh, or several subsystems uh, configurations composed in a larger system configuration and allows us to be able to work at different levels to be able to build up those configurations. And really the goal here, unify our silos, make sure that we're not copying between these different silos uh, information, make sure we work consistently, meaning I can work in my subsystem work and that subsystem work is contributing to my system. And Above all, we wanna be able to enable reuse. So these configurations are reusable. These are the units that I can reuse, whether it's across products and some PLE uh, scheme, or whether it's simply just being able to reuse in different releases of a particular product. It gives us a lot of flexibility to operate. So what are these, uh, what are we doing in the, in the future with these things? Um, we wanna work in the large, meaning uh, we wanna be able to work on uh, across the enterprise and things like product releases, safety cases, like we talked about in the last discussion, we need to have a configuration to be able to know what that holds to. Um, and then this ALM PLM unification, it's something that's been ongoing and we've been discussing it for years and years. Um, OSLC provides us a bit more of a foundation to be able to talk about configurations and how they align. Um, and in the small, we'll start working more in terms of how do we do subsystem development? How do we do things like gate reviews and asset reviews? Um, those are gonna be important as we work more and more with different tools that allows us to be able to look at multiple different repositories and then be able to provide a context. And that context is your enterprise configuration. So with that, um, I had one more little demo, but I think we're running kind of short on time. So if we have questions, we can do that. Otherwise I can do, a little demo before we get into the next session. So Eric, I'll take a pause a second and let me know if there's any uh, questions that we can uh, talk about and ask.